I have always brought things to the gut, thus healthy mm -hmm. gut girl, right? Yes. I always say, what are you eating? How are you digesting it? Are you absorbing it? And are you passing the waste from that? And then when you get back down to that bowel, and we talked about motility and constipation and go only pooping once a day or once every week or whatever, we have an entire colony, or we're supposed to, of microbes in the bowel called a strobilome. And a strobilome, funny enough, are all microbes that process, metabolize, and get rid of estrogen. And if you don't have that, if that colony is extinct or it's low, it's like a small population or you're, you don't have enough, guess what they eat? Fiber. If you don't have enough fiber in your diet, you, that astrobolone cannot work. And now what's happening is you are not excreting that estrogen that's coming from the liver, that's getting processed at the liver and then dumped into the bowel you are recycling. You're not pooping it out and getting rid of it. You're recycling it back into the system. And the really sad thing about estrogen is the more it gets recycled into the body and not conjugated or processed at the liver, the more toxic it becomes. Mm -hmm. And this estrogen starts to get stored in fat, in mm -hmm. adipose tissue, in the belly, that belly weight. It starts to affect insulin levels and this is like this domino effect with insomnia right it sets mm -hmm. off your ability to sleep through the night hey friends irene lyon here and welcome to this long form interview i have for you today with kitty martone you just saw a short video clip of a part of our conversation and i hope you watch the full length it is a longer one today we talked about a lot. I will read her bio in a second, but I met her originally um, when I was on her podcast, uh, kind of late December 2020. We'll link that discussion that her and I have, or had, I should say, in the show more section. And we get into all sorts of things today, the gut microbiome, circadian rhythms, hormones, sleep, um, her story uh, going from being very, very unwell to, as, you'll, as you've seen, and as you'll see, very healthy and vibrant into her early 50s. And she's just a wealth of information and knowledge, and I wanted you to learn about her. So here's her official bio. She's known as Health, Healthy Gut Girl on social media. So Healthy Gut Girl Kitty Martone is the host of the podcast, Stuff Your Doctor Should Know. I love that title. And I say that because I can't tell you how many times my students and those of you who find the information here on this channel will say, how come my doctor doesn't know this? So just such a great podcast title. So she is a three-time author of top-rated Amazon gut-centric books. She is a master herbalist and functional nutritionist and investigative health journalist. So without further ado, enjoy your conversation and anything that we talk about, any links, everything will be below so that you can do more research, follow up with her, follow her. And oh, one other fun thing in our talk, we laughed and kind of joked about how we should collectively, the two of us start our own podcast. It might just be that I interview her a few more times and she interviews me, but let us know what you think about that idea. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions from our talk, we would love to know. Take good care, and we will see you when I drop a new video in the following week. Bye for now. Hello, hello, Kitty. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's so good to chat and see you in person. Um, I've already mentioned that you were, I was on your show. Now we're gonna change sides and, and have really just a conversation about hormones and gut health and sleep and all those things. That's a big bag of stuff. It's a big bag. So we're going to see where we get to. And um, I often get the question, um, what are your thoughts on sleep and supplements and all these things, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we'll get into that. But what I would love to do first is um, get to know your origin story. Like, where did you start off on this journey? Like, when you graduated from high school, were you like, this is what I'm going to do and now you're doing it? Or was there like all these curves to getting to where you are today? Oh, yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, my middle name is Curve. <laughs> like, I think I'm doing some, I think I have my plan and then it's, you know, it's always ends up different. But I think like a lot of practitioners um, of all sorts end up being a practitioner because of their own health challenges. And that's mm -hmm. certainly my story. You know, I was, I was born very, very early and I was always sick. Just that was, I was just the kid with the ear, nose and throat, gut, always missing school, you know, and then puberty hits and it's times a hundred. And mm. then, you know, and then I get to be an adult. Actually, I think I became an adult. I'm, <laughs> I'm still questioning that now, but I become an adult and it just gets harder and harder physically for me to, to be out there and about. Um, I was happy to leave high school though. I just, I just, uh -huh. you know, had focusing problems and attention deficit disorder. And it was just, which they didn't diagnose back then yet. And, um, mm -mm. so it was just difficult for me to, I wanted to be something in entertainment. I want, I was, I was always in theater and I wanted to be an actress and I wanted to, be a model and I wanted to be a dancer, you know, I think as children that are super hyper tend to lean towards that stuff anyway. And that was me. I was very hyper, but the, the health challenges would just stop me from completing mm -hmm. any kind of schooling. And, um, I just couldn't do it. I just could never complete a course in anything. Cause I would just be so distracted or out of, you know, because I was ill. And then, um, I moved to LA to try to pursue that uh, entertainment world and fell into this alternative world of healing where I saw people who were going to acupuncturists. I mean, you could, you know, you really couldn't find that in New Mexico where I'm from. Right. Um, and uh, even though I was brought up with kind of an herbal background, my mom was really into home remedies and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it just was really foreign. I was still on the typical Western diet and. Uh, so I, I started to, um, have problems taking medication. So everything I was given for migraines and, you know, the birth control pill and, and mm. Amitrex and allergy meds, they all sort of started to, uh, create reactions in my body, histamine problems and insomnia and, uh, wonky periods and just all kinds of issues. And I started to wonder if it was the combination of drugs I was taking. Wow. So the people I was meeting in LA started to say, Hey, have you, you should see my acupunctures. You should see my Reiki. I was Reiki. What <laughs> you should see, you know? And so I started to pursue that and it was tremendous. It was, um, mm -hmm. that's how I met my husband. Who's a, a, a chiropractor and he okay. is not just your average sort of go in and get your neck cracked and, and your ribs popped, but he was this sort of holistic, you know, address the global human, like, you know, from the inside out. Uh, and he introduced me to cleansing and fasting and um, energy medicine, quantum reflex analysis, the all these things. And once I, you know, I fell in love with him, but then I just fell in love with the world that he was in. And I just went in the deep end. And started working well he works with children who are disabled mm -hmm. he works with kids who are um, autistic and who have vaccine injuries and children who have cerebral palsy and so i wasn't able to help them with my sort of conventional nutritional information i had to start dig deeper to figure out how to help these kids and that's how i found gut health and donna gates of the body ecology mm -hmm. diet and Natasha McBride of the Gut and Psychology Syndrome. And off I went. Wow. So just to reel back a little bit, you said that you were, well, you were born premature. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. I was born a month early, a month too soon. Mm -hmm. And I had, within the first couple of weeks, I think it was like the second week of being a human being, um, I was, uh, I got spinal meningitis Oh wow! and I was put back into the hospital. And while I was in the hospital, spinal meningitis, I got pneumonia. Oh wow. So I spent the first three or four months of my life in and out of NICU. And, um, yeah, so that was, that was a, a tough traumatic baby life. No definitely. Kidding. No kidding. And for those listening to this who are new to our work, to my work, to your work, but also to mine, um, 
this is a very common what we would consider early developmental trauma which obviously you know um, because I learned from you <laughs> there you go you learn from from me and that's so good and actually did you not ever have that named before we ch oh wow I heard I heard things like you know you um, you had birth trauma uh, oh. but I never associated the fact that I was away from my mother in this little incubator not being touched by human hands with gloves, you know, being touched with gloves. And, gloves. you know, I, I mean, I spun out when I talked to you and my show afterwards. I was thinking oh. of this little baby in a diaper cloth diaper with sandbags on my arms and legs to hold me down to keep me from flailing and pulling IV tubes out of my body and such. And mm. I mean, that, I mean, I, yeah, no, I never thought about that. I thought it was early and I had some health issues, yeah. but I never associated it with that. Amazing. So even though your health had dramatically shifted when we spoke, because it was just this past year that we met and mm -hmm. I spoke with you about the nervous system and trauma, you still did a really good job at getting your health on board Yeah. without that knowledge of that being early trauma, most likely attachment stuff, developmental trauma. Yeah. I mean... I think the the real missing piece, because it certainly had um, crossed my mind on, you know, people had mentioned it with the healers I had worked with and whatnot, s certain facets of, of your work, a little bit here and there. But what really hit me with your work mm -hmm. was how we store it, how we store it in our bodies. So yeah, mentally I processed it. I can, when I, when I would go through things in my life where I maybe was in a relationship and had some separation anxiety or feeling abandoned, I would process that psycholog you know, in my brain, I would process that. But the way my body reacts to stress, the way that I react to uh, when I get ill, how it cascades into, I can't just get a cold. It has to turn into a sinus infection and that has to turn into walking right. pneumonia. And then I go into this, you know, it sets off, it triggers a viral reaction in my spine. And right. those things I never correlated with my trauma as a baby. The early stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And now, however, if you do get a little sore throat, if you even do get sore throats these days, mm -hmm. it's just, it, would I, am I correct to assume it's just that? It's just a little tickle? Exactly. I did, you know, right before COVID, and I know you've heard this a bunch, and so I, I have as well, is um, I, like in late October, early November, I got a, a chest cold, a, a full on, and it was, I hadn't been that sick since I was a child and, wow. or a young adult. And it was everything described as COVID. So, but, but prior to that, yes, you're right. I had, I, 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 it doesn't take me down in that way, but mm -hmm. there is this thing I have and I'll spare you the details, but it That's is, okay. it's just a long story. <laughs> just this viral thing because of you know, having a type of viral encephalitis as a child, yeah. and then it kind of recurs in me. It's like a her the herpes virus manifesting mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. form of meningitis. And <clears throat> that, I, I still get that, not as frequently. And because it's, it's the herpes virus, I know how to navigate through alkalizing my system and reducing stress and whatever. But that piece that we shared in my podcast, that was like, of course. I mean, I had spinal meningitis as a kid, and this is exactly what takes me down now. Is a spinal-related issue? Is that coincidence? Of course no, it's not, right? of course it's not. Yeah, so that was brilliant. That's, in that's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, and it's true. These things can stay dormant in our system forever. Yeah. Um, it's like shingles with chicken pox, for example. Another example there, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so interesting. Um, okay so many avenues to go here. I'm curious, when you came to LA, what year was that? Like what was going on in the vibe of LA? Oh my goodness. It was it just take us back to that world. Okay. I'll just say a couple of, I'll give you a couple hints. Um, earthquakes, fires, and riots. <laughs> <laughs> it was the OJ Simpson trial, the Northridge earthquake, um, the riots in down in, uh, out near, um, 
not Compton. Remember those riots that happened? I can't remember the name of them. It was with uh, the guy who was um, saying, can't we all just get along? He oh, got gosh, beaten. Yeah. It was uh, Rodney King. Rodney King. The Rodney King beating, the Rodney King riots, um, yes. the fires, and, and O.J. Simpson. And O.J. Simpson. So and that was like 97, 98-ish. Three? Was it 93? It was right. Okay, I think, wow. Like 90, I think I arrived in the uh, fall of 93 because the earthquake happened in January of 94, I think. Okay. I, I might be a year off, but sure. yeah, incredible. Like, hi, welcome. Uh, 7.5 earthquake. <laughs> and you're still in LA, in LA area. I'm in Venice Beach, yeah. Yeah. Because I yeah. couldn't get enough of the chaos and the mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your energy is grounding something in that area, probably, mm -hmm. is my sense. Um, well, let's talk. I've got a list here for everyone listening. Kitty sent me this long list of things, um, <laughs> which is super, super helpful. Um, and some of the topics I want to touch on, sleep, gut health, hormones. Um, and I'm... I'm going to put a disclaimer to this for everyone listening. We already talked about this over email and, and before we started recording is I see lots of clients and students who cannot sleep and their hormones all, are all over the place. And whether they verified that medically or they just know intuitively things are off, mm. you know, hair is falling out, skin is dry uh, for women, their menstrual cycles are off the chart, those sorts of things. Um, and they get into the nervous system work that I offer and, and for many people, it miraculously shifts. Now, of course, that is not in a vacuum because as you heal your nervous system, you're also starting to make different choices mm. with food, your intuition shifts. You might crave more healthy fat, something that you had in your list here. Um, you might just be better at boundaries. So your system's not going into a stress response all day the way it may be used to. And so these things start to trickle into the biology, the neurochemistry, obviously the hormones. Um, so that can sometimes help sleep, but then sometimes people need a little extra, mm -hmm. a little extra boost. And so that's what I wanted to kind of pick your brain on today. Um, t tell me what, what is a circadian rhythm? Because you have here microbiome and circadian rhythm. And I feel like those two topics we could riff on for a, a day. <laughs> um, and I know microbiome is kind of getting thrown around, in my opinion, the way the nervous system and trauma is getting thrown around now. Mm -hmm. And so for you, with your expertise as a practitioner and all that stuff, how would you define the microbiome as a first one? Then we'll tackle circadian rhythm. Mm. Um, well, I like what you said about it's not in a vacuum because there's also, you know, just aging, just as we age, our hormones shift. And so you could have nailed down your perfect protocol and you're doing amazing. And then two months goes by or, or two years go by and all of a sudden that program's not working. And that could be mm -hmm. why it could be because of that reason, right? So the microbiome is a collection of microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungus, um, parasites that um, live on us and in us. Uh, we have three to five pounds of microbes, bacteria that live in our, in our guts, just like a sack of potatoes, just in us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and this, this, uh, collection, this inner ecosystem is uh, basically running the show. We are more microbe than we are human cell. And 98% of our metabolic functions are governed by microbes. They make the decisions. They make things happen in us. And that's always blowing my mind because that means that even your food choices or the things you prefer, the things you, the, the, that you uh, gravitate towards, hot beverages, spicy food, bitter lettuces, uh, sugar, refined sugar versus fruit sugar, um, certain movies, you know, uh, emotional things, um, how you, you know, you don't like scary movies, but you love 
uh, dramas and comedies or whatever, these things can actually be influenced. And I would even venture to say, as far as I've been studying, as long as I've been studying the microbiome now, that they almost all are governed or at least triggered or they give you the impetus to want to do these things, even choosing a film. Because at the core of these things, they're, they're conducting, they're like a conductor in a symphony, our hormones, our brain chemicals, everything, our digestion, how we process our foods, how we break down our foods. So yeah, that's the microbiome for you. <laughs> crazy okay so i'm very curious what how would the microbiome affect the fact that i love action movies <laughs> or it just because that might be the one like what mm. i understand food and emotions because yeah. the gut goes into the the vis you know it all trickles through to the brain but but speak okay. to that one a little bit more. That's well, interesting. Well, so let's break it down from the top down. So we're looking at, let's yeah. say, an action movie that has, like a Michael Bay film that has lots of explosions and, you know, beautiful people. And um, so <laughs> this gives you, while you're watching this, this is giving you this um, spark. You know, you're for two hours, you're on the edge of your seat and you mm -hmm. are uh, fully engaged with all that's going on viscerally and visually. And you might have maybe a, an adrenal um, uh, load. Maybe you are exhausted. Your adrenals are a little bit on the low side and your cortisol is a little mm -hmm. bit on the low side. And so your body needs a pick-me-up. So you enjoy oh, being a little bit afraid or a little bit excited or anticipation. Mm -hmm. Those things all speak about cortisol rushes, right? Well, cortisol mm -hmm. um, and a lot of hormones, they, if they aren't totally produced in the gut, they are uh, the signal to the adrenal glands, the signal that's given is given by, uh, or the, uh, to, for your adrenals to create that hormone, that signal yeah. comes from the gut. And the what's gut. in the gut? Your microbes that microbes. are controlled, your enteric nervous system, not your yes. central nervous system, which is no. your brain and your spinal cord, spinal right? Cord. Mm -hmm. It's that communication between those two, and it begins with those microbes saying, you know, we need a little excitement in our lives. Let's watch a Michael Bay film. <laughs> oh, okay. You just you just uncovered me a little bit there. <laughs> I wouldn't say I would pick Michael Bay, but no, I um, wouldn't either. <laughs> Uh, um, maybe Quentin Tarantino, a little more go. kind of artistic flair, mm -hmm. a little drama. A little darker, oh. yes. a on the dark side. Yes. Oh, now we're talking yes. about throwing a little estrogen, estrogen okay. uh, balance there, needing a little feeling tugged on those, on that, uh, those heart strings and that darkness of like broody, you know? Oh yeah, let's pick this apart. <laughs> okay, maybe we'll just talk about movies for the next hour. Um, that's so no, it's so interesting. Um, it's gosh. like people, you know, people who are addicted to like adrenaline junkies that go like skydiving and jump out of jet jet you know, suits. You know, I was that person. Do you know that? No, I didn't know that. Oh gosh, no, this was like my twenties and thirties. I was I was a intense expert skier, like mountaineer, diving into cliffs like face deep in powder what um i mean that's what led me to my injuries which okay. led me to the feldenkrais which led me to se so it's all a divine plan but no i was a hardcore skier and i actually was supposed to start race car driving in my 20s i even had an agent that's who was amazing. ready to ready to groom me to be the first f1 female i'm not kidding like he was ready for that <laughs> And I decided to go to um, master's degree instead and study more science instead of oh that. Oh, my goodness. Well, lucky us. But, wow, oh, I would have liked to have seen. I could totally see that, though. I could see you so, in a little helmet, in a car. I could see Oh, that. yeah. I still might do it. I might I might dabble now that I'm not able to. I can't ski anymore because of my knees, mm. um, the arthritis in them. I'm still hopeful that might happen. But at this point, it's not there. But the other thing I used to do is paraglide. Um, wow. so, which is not skydiving. It's a bit different. And I did that for eight years Wow. and I do miss elements of it, but it is very dangerous. I would love to paraglide. Oh my goodness. Wow. Go I'm so impressed. So, so when you were saying that about the movies, 
Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, God, that makes so much sense because so much of my world now is, and I love this, but it's academic, it's cerebral, it's very somatically chill. And so there's that little part of my, I think it's in my genetic soul makeup mm-hmm. that wants to go fast. I swear I was probably a race car driver or like a Roman <laughs> a gladiator back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that though. That's mm-hmm. really cool. It's so, it's there's so many layers and, and that, you know, that is, makes a lot of sense because that kind of like living on the edge feeling could have come from, you know, you're like, you talk about stored, you know, trauma as a child, like what happened with your microbiome then that your body is constantly wanting this. Now you can say it's a personality trait. Sure. But you know, is it also these microbes know what, what you need or they know now there's also this, like, does it mean it's good for you? Not necessarily. What if you've got more bad guys in control in your gut than you have good guys? And they're the ones that are edging on those, that need for cortisol, that need for speed. (laughs) Totally. And just for those who aren't familiar, cortisol is secreted by the adrenals, which sit on top of our little kidneys. And they're sort of the fight flight reactionary glands that say danger, danger, let's put out adrenaline, cortisol. Those are two of them. so okay microbiome gut this is my cole's notes cliff notes (laughs) lots of weight five pounds is a lot yep three to five pounds depends on the person i suppose the person Mm -hmm. and how do you then define the circadian rhythms if we Mm. just sort of go into the glossary of terms here yeah i actually i wrote this one out because because as you can tell i can talk a lot so i just wanted to make this brief So um, the circadian rhythm, for people who don't know what that is at all, it's the natural cycle of physical, mental, and behavioral changes that the body goes through in a 24-hour cycle. And the circadian rhythm regulates our body's energy expenditure, like how we spend our energy, our Mm -hmm. appetite, and our sleep. And um, researchers have discovered that this, they call it rhythmicity, fancy pretty word, the rhythmicity Mm -hmm is controlled by the microbes. So that wow. circadian rhythm is literally controlled by your microbiome. And so all the microbes, as we talked about before in our guts have different functions. They, um, they excrete metabolites, which is just a fancy way of saying that the, the microbes waste their byproducts. So they're eating the vitamins you, you consume in your food. They're eating amino acids. They're eating things or they're making amino acids as well. And then their, their waste, their poo, their whatever they excrete mm-hmm. is usable in the body. And that those are called metabolites. And they can make short, fain, uh, short chain fatty acids, which, which help like heal the gut. And they do things like regulate fat metabolism and control glucose levels. And they, uh, like I said earlier, they even can convert amino acids into like brain chemicals like serotonin and melatonin and I'm sorry, serotonin and GABA. Um, and uh, so, and they also control gut motility. So how often and frequently you go to the bathroom, that transit time of food and waste in the body. And then of course, they um, even uh, control the production of the sleep hormone, which is melatonin. (laughs) Wow. Okay. There's a lot there. Um, The thing that popped into my mind as you were reading that great definition is the connection between the gut and the microbiome. And obviously now there's these circadian rhythms and the influence on the brain chemicals. And one of the things that I get asked a lot, so I'm, I'm kind of going in a few directions here. So bear with mm-hmm. me, everyone. People will often ask, Irene, can I do your work? Can I heal at this nervous system level if I am on certain pharmaceuticals such as antidepressants, mm. such as the medications that are supposedly supposed to regulate hormones and chemicals my sense though from just being in this world and it's not my expertise pharmaceuticals by any means but it is going to impact the microbiome of the gut just like a course of antibiotics would Mm. 
do you, have you looked into this at all? Because I, I, I always say to people, you know, if you've had to take something pharmaceutical wise, don't sweat it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like, yes, that might have had to have helped you. You didn't know about food and the microbiome and and all the things that we're going to talk about to help these rhythms and the microbiome. But once a person has, let's say, been on um, pharmaceuticals such as antidepressants, et cetera. And if, if you've worked with folks around this, what is your advice? What is your MO on these and how they impact the biome? And how, while someone might get some relief from some of these m medical aids, if we call them that, um, how is it impacting the rest of the system? How does that trickle out? Hmm. And how might someone start to shift out of that or prepare the system so that they can start to wean off? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first off, I think thank God for pharmaceuticals because yeah. I wouldn't be here. Me too. Uh, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there is a time yeah. and a place. I think the, the big, the big problem and the, the travesty really of today is that it is the go-to, right? It is the, it's the first course of action is pharmaceutical intervention and that for most people on the planet now, and that, is, is the unfortunate side of this coin, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the psychotropic and antidepressants, these drugs that, that control, quote unquote, control the hormone, the endocrine system, I like mm -hmm. to say hijack because mm -hmm. they downregulate your body's production. Now, this isn't every single one of those drugs, but this is yeah. by and large those drugs that control depression and um, or suppress depression and um, uh, antidepressants, um, psychotropic drugs, things like this. They uh, and also benzos and and um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of these drugs. I, I would have to give you a list to know for specific which ones do this, but they um, they they hijack, they downregulate your body's ability to make its hormones naturally, certain hormones naturally, and certain brain chemicals naturally. And it, it interrupts that function. And so mm -hmm. in a pinch, I think in a, you know, it's, it has helped plenty of people. And of course, in my estrogen dominant support group mm -hmm. on Facebook, where there's 16,000 plus women, and, and they're almost all active on there, a large portion of these women are on some kind of um, antidepressant and so we have to work with it. We have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it helps a lot of people. But it's this ongoing, you know, hijack that bothers me. And so what do yeah. I do? Um, well, it, it, it is a problem. And I take each case individually. Um, and weaning off is something that I am not really really even I don't even like to say that to people. I just say, look, if you're if 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 they show interest in wanting to get off of those drugs, then we go down that road. But I never just say, hey, you should get off, right? right. Um, so th as far as the, uh, the drug does to the, what it does to the actual microbiome is um, it sedates, so to speak, a certain bacteria. And it also creates, so once you've affected your hormones, like we talked about earlier, how many functions your hormones have. and. Yeah. Um, it's going to have a massive effect on what the, the functions of each of those colonies of microbes do in the body, the ones that create brain chemicals, the ones that create GABA. I mean, what does um, uh, Prozac do to GABA? I don't know, but it certainly probably is doing something, right? Or, or dopamine yeah. or serotonin. And so these are all affected and these microbes get then get a downstream effect as well. And so... You know, I have never seen a client, um, or I should say I, all the clients that I see that are on these drugs have a gut um, imbalance. I issue, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, I mean, we're probably going to talk about that more in a bit in regards to leaky gut and, and who has a leaky gut. But definitely, mm -hmm. I would say people that are on ongoing 
um, medications, pharmaceutical medications, for longer than six months, um, definitely have are dealing with some form of leaky gut, some level of leaky gut. So since we went to that leaky gut word, mm. what is leaky gut from your point of view? And then I'll share mine from the nervous system point of view. And oh, great. The nervous nerve. So let's let's compare notes. Yeah. So leaky gut is the new, I don't know, new term, but it's a, a more <laughs> yeah. popular term now. Uh, um, and it is basically a, a permeable gut lining. So this means that the lining of your gut from your mouth to your back door um, but mostly leaky gut is referring to small and large intestine, but it can also be stomach. It can also be lungs and it, we won't go there, but, <laughs> um, and leaky brain, <laughs> leaky brain. So, yes. yeah. So the gut lining becomes compromised for many, di there's many different stressors that we can also talk about later, but so many different stressors. And one of them is, you know, ongoing chronic stress, um, and then medications they compromise the integrity of the lining of the gut and the tight junctions in the gut start to sort of give way and space becomes uh yeah they kind of pull apart porous e porous that's a good word yeah and exactly and um and then the foods you eat the things you consume that pass through the gut the toxicity that's in the bowel the waste matter these things can start to make their way into the bloodstream and then once that happens it's just like rolling the dice for every individual what will happen to you versus what will happen to me what your auto immune response is versus mine versus him we is anybody's guess so that can range from just regular old food sensitivities, food allergies to lupus, you know, it oh, wow. really can just be any number of things. Yeah. So in other words, what is supposed to stay in the gut and move through literally leaks out, gets into the bloodstream, which is where it should not be because it's meant to be digest and processed or excreted mm -hmm. through our waste product system mm -hmm. into our poop. Mm -hmm. um, but it's getting into our blood and that can essentially be some kind of trigger, if you will, for, as you said, it's anybody's guess, the genetic predisposition, the, mm. the weak link in the system, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Endotox okay. endotoxemia, endotoxicity is what it's called. It's when it, it doesn't have to be the food, it doesn't have to be like a piece of walnut that gets into your bloodstream. It's right. the waste product. It's the, the also the, the the waste from these microbes that are doing their job. These or, or parasites or you know mold or it's this it's this toxemia. It's this toxicity that sort of starts to leak its way or leach its way out of the out of the gut. Out of the gut where it's supposed to be. <clears throat> Interesting. So. Um, one of the parts of healing the nervous system um, would be regulating the nervous system so that the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are in good flow, that they're not competing against each other, they're not both turned on. And the one um, oversimplification that I find in really popular press, but this is kind of the dead giveaway if someone is actually trained well at the nervous system level, is the differentiating factors between the the parasympathetic nervous system and the dorsal vagus portion of the parasympathetic i don't know mm. if we i don't know if you've come across this i have but, heard it but i don't know <clears throat> okay well let's dive into it um the parasympathetic is basically for slowing us down mm -hmm. and it can happen a couple of ways it can be really quick with shock, that would be the high intensity freeze, right? Like big accident, big shock, big trauma. We shut down, everything slows down, blood pressure, heart rate, all of that. Um, it's a preparation for death, essentially. Hmm. So that's the, the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic. Dorsal, that's what dorsal. I Dorsal. Okay. Now there's, there's two more pieces to that, but I'll complete the other side of the parasympathetic. The other side is the ventral vagal. So right now, if I um, make a funny face to you, Kitty, you'll probably, you know, you know, there'll be kind of a funniness. You show me your teeth a bit more. It's funny, that kind of thing. That ventral, like that is us connecting at the ventral vagal level. 
it's what you as that little infant probably desperately wanted was connection, ventral facing, soothing mama tones, smiles, and that actually directly goes to the heart, the SA note of the heart to calm it down. Mm. So that is how we learn self-regulation is through another human being's ventral vagal of the parasympathetic, especially when we're infants. Um, so that's another portion of the parasympathetic that again is rarely spoken about, but it's what makes us mammals. It's why if you have a dog, you can turn your head like that and smile at it and it gets excited or, you know, those sorts of things. But the dorsal branch of the parasympathetic that I mentioned a second ago has two, we call it tones. It's like a gear shift of a car, you know, like a stick shift Mm -hmm. where it's the same engine, but you've got these different gears that put it into different high or low states. And so a high tone of the dorsal is that shock. It is that, that shutdown. Whereas the low tone is the true rest digest. So a lot of people say they oversimplify by saying, oh, parasympathetic is rest digest. That's half true because there's these other branches of the vagus nerve. Hmm. And so the low tone dorsal, which is true rest digest, when we are in that state, that's the siesta time. That's the chill. Like I'm hanging, just chilling after my meal. Um, It's the state we want to be in when we sleep. So this might segue beautifully into our sleep conversation. So when we're in low tone dorsal, it's like the, the, the human system gears down into repair, regeneration, and immune enhancing mode. And it also gears into what's called gut um, barrier keeping of the gut lining, hmm. which is literally a stitching back up. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's keeping the gut lining in barrier mode. And so I just, whenever I say that, I think of like a, a like um, a loom that's stitching up things or a, or a sewing machine that's, you know, mm-hmm. stitching everything up. And so that low tone dorsal, it puts the, the biology, the physiology into regeneration, repair and, and barrier keeping of the gut. So if we now think someone who's highly stressed, someone who has unresolved trauma, all that stuff, if their system is living in a sympathetic state of fight flight, or if their system is living in a shutdown, high intensity freeze, numb out, dissociated, kind of checked out, tuned out state, they're going to be mm, humming, if you will, at the levels of high level stress even though they might be super calm. Mm, I, that just, you just described a handful of people to me that I know. Like, <laughs> I'm chill, nothing bothers me, and I never cry, or I never get angry, or I never can fully let my guard down, or I can't sleep at night, or my gut's all over the place. And so that, that, that low tone dorsal, we need for healthy recovery. Mm. But if we have this unresolved trauma, this survival stress in the system, um, it's just not going to work because the system isn't going into that repair gear at night specifically. And then you throw in some other things that aren't providing good sleep hygiene and you've kind of got this disaster waiting to happen, Mm. so to speak. Mm. That just blew open a lot of stuff. The... um... The, the circadian rhythm thing that I wrote, uh, mm-hmm. I got from, and maybe we can, I can even send you this link so you can yeah. tag it to notes or whatever, is, is actually about, um, it's very in-depth about the gut microbiota um, and the particular bacteria in the gut that work at night. They mm-hmm. do their job at night. And they Fun. rely, yeah, <laughs> and this is, just speaks to exactly, they're the ones that's stitching and looming. Yeah. yeah, and they're using all that good healthy fat you had today and all that and vitamin A and all of that, you know, collagen, and they're using those things and short-chain fatty acids, which is so important, especially for in mother's milk, you know. I mean, not to segue, but, you know, babies are born with a permeable, with a permeable gut. Babies, babies yeah. have leaky gut when they're born. So, um, and it isn't until three months of, of, of life that they actually have a full 
inner ecosystem of their own. But up until wow. then, they're relying on mother's milk to get those, they're called oligosaccharides that are yeah. short chain fatty acids that help loom and stitch that intestinal lining and seal those, those junctures together in the junctions together. I say junctures or junctions? Yeah, junctions, uh, junctions, you know, same, same thing. Same thing. There. Um, <laughs> and they seal them up in the gut and create this um, tight, the barrier, right? And, Interesting. And, but some of those, uh, so that circadian rhythm is important because those particular bacteria need, to, need you to be asleep for them to do their job. And mm. when we have this upset circadian rhythm or we have this problem with not being able to sleep, it makes sense that then stress would equal leaky gut, right? That's really interesting about the, the infant not having a fully sealed gut until three mm. months of age. Um, I didn't, I, that's, that's cool. That's news to me, but it also makes sense when we consider a, a baby that's born, doesn't have a fully functioning immune system yet. Mm either yeah. and they need to be exposed to stuff to build up that immunity right yeah that's so important that's what that birth canal is all about you know getting just saturated with mama's mama's stuff. bacteria good and yeah. bad and so yeah. c-sections you know they're doing the seeding now where they're taking the q-tip and they're you know a swabbing mama's vaginal canal and all the fluids that came with and then putting it in the ears and the nose and the mouth and the you know genitals of the baby mm -hmm. and and it's like a seeding process and then hopefully mother's milk will help proliferate that that colostrum that baby gets mm -hmm. helps that really high high sugar content actually yeah. and these oligosaccharides the these saccharides. fats and fibers and that those bacteria eat which then brings me to the most important thing that we'll get to with the hormones is um, yeah. is the uh, the fiber you know, mm -hmm. like 95% of people don't get enough fiber. And they're oh. like, oh, fiber makes you poop. No, fiber <laughs> is what those bacteria need to eat. They are living off of the fiber and converting that fiber, that waste into necessary things to heal the gut. And um, also the, I'm going to let you go because I might go off into no. a hormone direction here. Well, fiber is interesting and that... Um... I mean, if we think about bowel movements for a second, if we talk about them, it's my life, you know, <laughs> there, yeah, there's, I, I mean, I'll say one of my uh, mentors, Kathy Kane, who taught me a lot of my early trauma work and knowledge. She said, I love having conversations about poops. Basically, that's the first thing I ask my clients is how is your poops doing? How are your bowels doing? Because it's, yeah. it is that first brain it is the sign of good health mm -hmm. and you know i've met people who have said oh yeah i i i only poop a couple times a week and i'm like what mm -hmm. and so i guess we're here to say if you're only pooping a couple times a week or once every other day there's an issue there. Would you oh, agree? Yeah. Absolutely. I'm going to go as far a little further and say that yeah. if you aren't pooping, that if you are only pooping one time a day, that can be considered low grade constipation. It wow. can be. And that, and that doesn't just mean like, even if it's too watery, that can also be a, a type of constipation where the body will flood the bowels to get it out. And then you're like, oh, I had a great poop. It was all watery, but it's the body like, okay, we got to move that, that motility we talked about. We got to move this stuff out before it, to you know, toxifies the body. And so you'll have these really loose, loose stools in the morning, which right. can also be low grade, low grade constipation. Constipation. Yeah. So <laughs> since we're on the topic, what would constitute the look of a good bowel movement? Mm. Um, like, is there, a, is there like a gold standard? Yeah, there is. Uh, definitely f uh, firm, but not hard. Mm -hmm. um, definitely fo well formed. So, you know, loose stools and watery stools and PC, as they say. Um, actually, a client used to say that. I still have PC poop. Um, her what goal is that was like? to it's not like... have, it comes out in pieces. Pieces. Like, yeah. Yes. Um, or undigested food in the, in the stool is not good. So you want it to be well-formed, 
I mean, it's going to be smelly because that's what it is, but it shouldn't yeah. be like highly offensive. It should also not stick to your anus or your rectum. You shouldn't, you know, when you clean, you should have to just clean, wipe once and that should be yeah. the deal. Um, yeah. uh, and it should, it shouldn't be, there shouldn't be pain. There shouldn't be blood. Um, mm -hmm. And then color varies because it really depends on what you're eating. So your I don't food. get into those. Yeah. It depends on what you've eaten. Yeah. No, um, that's interesting. Yeah. All right, there. That that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. It's partial. I mean, that's another thing we could talk about all day is poop and, you know, what what it means and when you're detoxing and all that and if you're hydrated yeah. and stuff. But yeah, basically. Well, let's 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 turn make a turn into hormones. Okay. And you know the 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 interesting thing with hormones is we all have them. There's sex hormones, there's stress hormones, there's hormones that bring sugar into the right places that break down fat and all these things. What is your kind of Coles Notes version, uh, Cliff Notes version of hormone health? Mm -hmm. Do you have a kind of an elevator pitch on them the way I might with the nervous system? Mm. Kind of putting I, on the I spot I will here. now. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think that I, I don't like categorizing them so much. I don't like saying yeah. like progesterone is a female pregnancy hormone or I don't like saying those things and that's just my own because they aren't just that. You know, estrogen is not just a female hormone and progesterone is not just a pregnancy hormone and, you know, testosterone is not just a male hormone. Melatonin yeah. is not just a sleep hormone. Um, all of them work together together. And again, going back to that concept of, of a symphony, of a concert, you know, the, the horn section is no less or more important, you know, than the string section. Strings, it, yeah. It's like it all has to, in concert, work together. The endocrine system, I had, I thought the microbiome was confusing when I started <laughs> studying it. I mean, I, I went to a conference uh, for Precision Analytical, which is the, the Dutch, they, they make the Dutch Hormone Lab, which is an, a, a comprehensive in-home urine lab that you can do yourself and send off, and it's incredibly comprehensive. It's just okay. all the metabolites, it's incredible. So I'm at this conference as a journalist, you know, because you had to be a, a doctor, and um, right. there was all, there were all these experts, these functional medical doctors who have been, you know, working with breast cancer their entire careers and working with, you know, testosterone in men and uh, delivering babies, all kinds of experts mm -hmm. in their field. And they were taught, none of them agreed. <laughs> huh? We were talking about progesterone and taking progesterone. Nobody agreed. They all had different things to say. They agreed on some very fun, fun, fundamental things like what, you know, what the, um, what the uh what they do in the body but they couldn't agree on a lot of of why they do it and the functions of the I mean, it was an unbelievably complex and i thought i felt so much better because i was like you know what i feel so much better i don't i'm it's not because i'm not a doctor it's no. just because it's incredibly con confusing so okay so that didn't wasn't a good explanation no 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 no, no. <laughs> i think that's really good and actually it's brilliant because um, my sense is, and correct me if I'm wrong, the experts, doctors at that conference, they weren't being um, ma malicious with each other. It was just a healthy debate. Yeah, yeah, uh, they were. They're just like, I don't know. They're saying, I don't practice that way, but that's interesting that you do. <laughs> right, and I think it, to me, it's this, it's parallels um, neuroscience. And what, what I do in my field and what other people do who study different things within the nervous system is I often say, like, well, I know what works in my suite of work because we have the evidence anecdotally, but lots of it. Mm -hmm. um, but God, we just don't know what yeah. the heck is going on. We do know bits, you know, if someone is a diabetic, we know that they probably need insulin or some change in their diet, those sorts of things. Like there's some simple things that we understand, mm -hmm. but I can recall, um, and I'm not going to get this research right, but Stephen Porges, who um, kind of categorized and put the polyvagal theory out on the map, um, he's a researcher scientist. His wife, Sue Carter, studies oxytocin 
and that's her line of work. So like a power academia couple, those two. Wow. And I can't remember what it was. So forgive me, everyone listening. Um, but she was speculating that there was another element to that oxytocin thing that we still haven't found mm. because something, and this is how academia works. It isn't done. You know, it's not, it's unless it's like it's so factual. It's unless it's so factual that there has been so many meta analyses and epidemiology, it's like, we definitely know that this causes this Mm. to get to that point takes time. So she was like, yeah, there's something we're missing here Mm. that, you know, is maybe a micro hormone or a, 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 a micron of something that isn't even a hormone that is something different that our technology can't even find yet. Yeah. I love that. But it is daunting because, yeah, you know, it's that, I think it's that 17 year theory or 17 year rule or whatever oh, it's me. called where, um, you know, uh, it takes about 17 years for new technology or new information, medical information to get into a doctor's office that you're seeing face to face. So yeah. this, this is a perfect example of um, people are still talking about probiotics like let's all get on probiotics just conventional probiotics that you can buy at Costco or Trader Joe's or Walmart right. and we're the the the, the technology the uh, information and the research already knows that it's not such a good idea to get on a probiotic there are certain types of probiotics that are a good idea but you in fact they even think that it's what's causing this epidemic of SIBO of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and so, and so, yeah, and this is this, and it's nobody's fault, really. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the nature of the way it is. And I'm dealing with it all the time with um, hormones and progesterone and uh, plant-based hormones like progesterone and estrogen and, and even mm-hmm. testosterone where, uh, you know, pl- a progesterone made from wild yam that is, is micronized progesterone is still looked at as a progestin, which is a synthetic progesterone that is in birth control. So if I, if I go to my Uh most gynecologist right now, you go to your, your doctor and you say, I'm on plant-based progesterone and they, and then they say, I don't think you should do that anymore. I think you should get off of that because it's a progestin and they don't even know the difference between these two hormones. And that's Mm. not really their fault. It's just that it hasn't arrived there yet. Meanwhile, we're reading these studies and we're learning in the background about, you know, these plant-based progesterones versus progestin. But that's, and that's going on with everything. The fact that your friend is studying one thing, oxytocin, that tells you so much, right? I mean, I could just study progesterone my entire life and probably never really get a, I'd probably feel like I knew less rather than more at the end of my career. (laughs) Well, that's a good, um, I agree. And one of the reasons I chose to not follow academia, because I touched into it for about a year and a half, give or take another year, because I was writing my dissertation, it drove me nuts, the the level of... um, singularity of just one thing and um it just didn't feel right Mm. and i'm remembering a quote from dr gabor mate i'm not sure if you're familiar with his work um, but he's a physician in vancouver who is really kind of um a leading person with addiction and trauma Mm. um adhd chronic illness etc but he has often said let's see if i can get it right trying to to find the cure for cancer by studying the cell is like trying to solve a traffic jam by studying the internal combustion engine (laughs) oh my goodness (laughs) that's amazing (laughs) and i'm like you nailed it yeah and and he has often said quite openly um that we we need to look at all factors so he understands that um but that there's no more re- and i don't fully agree with this in some aspects but in terms of chronic illness cancers etc heart disease autoimmune he said we don't need to study that anymore because we kind of know what a person needs to avoid those things for the most part 
Mm. Versus, you know, I'm all for people studying better prosthesis for people who are amputees, for example, like mm -hmm. that kind of research, I'm like, go for it. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of these chronic health pieces, it comes back to that, again, to go back to the microbiome, right? what's creating a healthy system from the ground up and also the connection with the environment mm -hmm. and what's in the environment. Right. So, um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I think sometimes that's why people like myself who are, who didn't start with being entrenched in, you know, the depths of one subject or, you know, specializing in one thing, but came from the outside in and had this overview. I think that's maybe why it's more helpful in some ways to people like to, to, to see practitioners like myself, because I have this overview, right? It's mm -hmm. like, you're not just focused on, all right, you have cancer. So let's just talk about the comb mm -hmm. the combustion engine, right? Let's go back and let's look at this traffic jam from the outside and say, oh, well, why don't we start with the fact that A, B or C, you know? Mm -hmm. and. I mean, I'm not saying that that should be the way it always is, but it's a nice thing to marry when you can have, you know, those specialists, but also people who can look at the big picture. At that um, intuitive element yeah. as well. Um, and then there's the people like, uh, you know, Kiran Krishnan, the microbiologist, and um, Jennifer Margulis, who's actually a, a journalist, but her mom, uh, I forget her first name, Margulis was uh, very famous with microbiome. She was one of the first people, um, scientists, to put the microbiome onto, you know, to actually uh, crack it open, so to speak, and, yeah. and realize that it was this universe inside of us. She happened to be married to Carl Sagan, of all people. Oh, um, interesting. Was his first wife, right? Talk about <laughs> the out, the outside universe and the inside universe. Yeah. Couple. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Hormones. And like, again, mm -hmm. we could, we could go on for hours, but what is, I think we both agree that looking at just one is not useful. Um, but what would be again, that kind of overview from hormone health in relationship to let's say sleep, let's maybe turn the corner towards sleep a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, because I know, I am, I studied this stuff ages ago. I don't keep up to date because it's just not my suite of work anymore. But the classic thing that I remember seeing like in the graphs was in the morning, your cortisol should go up. And then as the day goes on, your cortisol should go down. Mm -hmm. And what often happens, and I'm really oversimplifying this, so I want you to correct and fix this narrative okay. um, if need be, is that those who are highly stressed or living in a state of dysregulation where that autonomic nervous system is just confused and not in the right track mm -hmm. is they'll have the flip. And we often hear this is people will be dead tired in the day trying to do the things to keep themselves up. And then as the sun goes down, they get an energy boost and then they're wide awake, mm -hmm. not able to go to sleep until the sun comes back up again. Right. I'm sure you've heard that, that, song and dance from your clients and students every day <laughs> so what's going on there kitty <laughs> well there are so many different factors there are so many different stressors there's you know dietary uh lifestyle choices that ha have an effect but um let's just speak on it from the hormonal perspective um, yeah. when when it's flipped like that we're looking at someone whose adrenal glands are firing or trying to fire, trying to regulate um, the system, uh, and they're not able to do it. They're doing it as best they can, and they're having an issue. <laughs> um, now, mm -hmm. sometimes that can mean really high cortisol. Sometimes that can mean really low cortisol. And this, this can be... Um, and then there's free cortisol and then there's cortisone. There's all, it gets very in the weeds, but mm -hmm. overall I would say that this is an ongoing stress related issue to the adrenal glands. Now adrenal support is really important. We could talk about the, the, the six things that the adrenals need to be healthy, but you know, but then there's also this 
this component that you address um, with dealing with that, that trauma and those things that create this ongoing emotional stress. Mm -hmm. Well, so hormones, so cortisol isn't the only hormone we're dealing with here. So um, we're also dealing with um, insulin, we're dealing with adrenaline, we're dealing with epinephrine and norepinephrine, and we're dealing with estrogen, progesterone, melatonin. Um, so <laughs> it's a big so, party. Yeah. So let's go back down to the gut again and talk yeah. about, um, so I, I have always brought things to the gut, thus healthy mm. gut girl, right? Yes. I always say, what are you eating? How are you digesting it? Are you absorbing it? And are you passing the waste from that? Well, when we get to, so what that, those are the things I talk about all the time. And then when you get back down to that bowel, and we talked about motility and constipation and go only pooping once a day or once every week or whatever, we have an entire colony, or we're supposed to, of microbes in the bowel called a strobilome. And a strobilome, funny enough, are all microbes that process, metabolize, and get rid of estrogen. And if you don't have that, if that colony is extinct or it's low, it's like a small population or you're, you don't have enough, guess what they eat? Fiber. If you don't have enough fiber in your diet, you, that estrobilome cannot work. And now what's happening is you are not excreting that estrogen that's coming from the liver, that's getting processed at the liver and then dumped into the bowel. You are recycling. You're not pooping it out and getting rid of it. You're recycling it back into the system. And the really sad thing about estrogen is the more it gets recycled into the body and not conjugated or processed at the liver, the more toxic it becomes. Mm -hmm. And this estrogen starts to get stored in fat, in mm -hmm. adipose tissue, in the belly, that belly weight. It starts to affect insulin levels. And this is like this domino effect with insomnia, right? It sets mm -hmm. off your ability to sleep through the night. Now you've got, are you falling asleep at night and then waking up at three in the morning and can't go back to sleep? Mm -hmm. Are you, you can't fall asleep at all yeah. uh, and you stay awake and then at four in the morning when you see, see the sun peeking through the blinds, you finally fall asleep. Really tired. There's yeah. all these different reasons that we can not be sleeping. And so, and, and we could talk about that for several hours. But what yeah. I like to say is let's start with your digestion and make sure that that process of excreting spent hormones is happening. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. huge portion of it. So fiber, 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 fiber. fiber. <laughs> Seems so simple, right? It does. And just, I want to keep going on the, the hormone endocrine piece mm -hmm. into sleep. And we'll go through this list that you sent me for everyone to listen to. Um, fiber, there's two types, right? This is like basic nutrition 101, but there's insoluble and soluble fiber. For mm -hmm. you, is there a difference? Is there a better type of fiber? Um, yeah, I mean, I take, I like to take, um, well, first of all, I, I eat a tremendous amount of, of, you know, green leafy veggies yeah. and I eat a lot of, I eat more sweet potatoes than probably most people ever do. And that, and potatoes, um, yeah. which people are so afraid of, right? They just think potatoes and they think carbs and they think fat. And that's They're just, so good. I know, and, and they yeah. really are so good for you. And mm -hmm. um, so small potato, the smaller potatoes, and although the large, like big russets, those have a lot of good fiber in them. So, um, you the know. Skin especially, yeah, of course. The, yes. Yeah, skin. absolutely. Gotta eat the skin. And um, so I get it from my diet, and then I also yeah. take supplements. I take a regular type of like, um, like the Metamucil type, but it isn't mm -hmm. Metamucil. It's just uh, uh, the in inulin, um, the word's escaping me now. That's um, okay. And uh, that basic one that you can just get anywhere. But then there's these other types of fibers that, um, uh, this one called Precision Prebiotic, because pre okay. fiber is basically prebiotics. Prebiotic. Right? And, the pre and that particular one feeds the specific good bacteria. 
So that's a, that's a harder product to get, but it's really, really important because especially when you have people who have gut dysbiosis, a lot of gut problems and leaky mm. gut, because sometimes fiber will really upset them and they have a really difficult time even having fiber because they get yeah. bloated or they yeah. have issues with stomach aches and things. So it's, um, and that's more common than it used to be, unfortunately. So I have to be delicate with clients and I have to find out what's going on with their guts before we start just stuffing them with fiber, right? Um, yeah. Hydration and fiber go together. Like you have yes. to have plenty of hydration. Um, so, right. So from your food and then supplementing and yeah. soluble, insoluble, I'm like, let's get it all in there. Let's just make sure <laughs> that the bases are covered, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I came across a, um, I guess you would call it a supplement called Quenda. Have you ever come across this before? Mm -mm. It's very new to me. Um, but it is a soluble fiber with many different herbs that are often taken individually. Um, it's an Australian company. I'll link it near here. I'll send it to you. Okay. But my husband and I have been taking it the last couple of weeks because I'm experimenting with all these different things as well. Uh -huh. um, and it has, it has really moved. It's gotten the motility going in an incredible way. Um, nice. I, I am like, wow, this is actually working. It is something that I've had to titrate. You know, so they've got their instructions, but I'm listening to my body. They're saying, you know, take it every day. And then after two weeks, take two scoops. I'm like, no, I think I'm just going to ease into this a little more. Smart. Um, <laughs> which is important for these things. But um, yeah, I, it's been really interesting to see how that shifted um, the form of my bowel movements. Yeah. And they were good to begin with. And so I was like, oh, this is really interesting. It's actually doing something at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And we eat a lot of salad. We eat a lot of sweet potatoes probably mm -hmm. every other day at least. Mm -hmm. um, and so even with that, adding this seemed to be necessary mm -hmm. for the time being at least. You know, I want to throw so. in, since we're talking about sweet potatoes, and I, I really yeah. want to check that product out. Um, I, uh, the sweet potato thing, a lot, I, I have, I'd say 50% or more of my clients who have problems uh, with waking up in the middle of the night, not being able to go back to sleep. 50%, um, I'm guessing here. Uh, I say just have a couple of tablespoons of sweet potato before you go to bed. Because a lot of times, especially as we get older and we get head towards perimenopause and that estrogen thing starts to happen and hormones are crashing and insulin is getting triggered and we're, um, we're sorry, insulin resistance is getting triggered and we're, we're um, going to bed. And even though we might have eaten, we are running out of sugar in the middle of the night. And our brain will, well, probably our microbes, yeah, it'll, it'll, create this adrenaline surge um, to stabilize brain sh uh, your brain sugar in your, I'm sorry, blood sugar in your brain, and you will wake up and you'll be wide awake and you're like, what is going on here? And yeah, and it happens a lot with um, when you drink with women who, uh, and men, but you know, when we have wine at night or uh, alcohol at night and we get that 3 a.m. wake up, and this is not the sugar from the wine. This is, and this is something I learned recently. It's actually the activity of the adrenals in the liver processing the alcohol. And this is requiring cal caloric intake. It's requiring energy. And now you run out of energy. You run out of blood. You know, having a hypoglycemic moment in the middle of the night and your body kicks in that adrenaline, stabilizes your brain sugar, blood sugar in your brain. And guess what? You're wide awake thinking about probably panicking because that's what a lot of women wake up and have anxiety attacks, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet and I've potatoes. done it with you. Sweet potatoes. I love them. <laughs> mm -hmm. They're so good. So good. Okay. We were just getting into hormones. I want to park that because okay. like you said, we could, and it's so yeah. individual really, right? It is. And you need guidance, and... I think. You really need guidance. And that's why support groups are good and practitioners that get it are good because it's very, it's a place you've got to navigate through on your own. I mean, some women do great with no carbs. Some women do, you know, do terrible with no carbs. Like you have to understand why that is as a practitioner. Or yeah, I can't stress that enough because um, 
often when I've had conversations with folks around diet or functional medicine, I've done a few videos recently, there can be a little bit of a, not a panic, but a, oh my goodness, I guess I have to follow this thing. And this is, this chat with you is just more information mm -hmm. for people. And um, it's the same reason I can't do a video to tell someone how to heal their anxiety in 30 minutes because who knows why that's there. It can mm. be many, many reasons. Um, the one thing that came to mind uh, about the insulin sense of insulin resistance, which often people don't connect, and I have to put it in because of my extra science yes. background, is the need for maintaining our muscle mass as we age. Because muscle mass, it, it helps to um, stabilize blood sugar because the muscles need they feed off of obviously blood glucose. And so that's why that person who has more muscle bulk and who is very strong and fit can eat way more because they need that sugar to maintain that tissue, that body tissue, that skeletal mass. Mm. And I'm sure somewhere in the annals of the research halls, there are studies that have shown a change in muscle mass and, and just skeletal mass alongside insulin resistance. I'm pretty sure I saw some of those studies when I was doing my um, master's degree, which was all on high intensity resistance training in older adults. Wow. Right? And so I say that because we can get so hyper-focused on the diet, which is important, or we can get so hyper-focused on the nervous system, which obviously for me is super important, but I often like, are you exercising and are you lifting weight? And what happens typically as we get older is people stop lifting the heavy weight. Right. They stop exerting high intensity, but we need to maintain that muscle mass for not just strength and function, but for that health of the blood sugar, glucose, insulin. Oh my goodness, that's thing. amazing. I didn't really know that. And I, if, you know, you think muscle mass, you think testosterone and you think about right. those things. but. You know, I'm 51 now, and I am going through what can only be described as muscle wasting. And I know why. You know, I know what's happening. I know what I'm doing wrong. Yeah. But because I'm at that age, and I've always been doing those things wrong, and because I'm at the <laughs> age that I am, it's just manifesting as this muscle wasting, which is going to affect testosterone levels and libido and um, mm -hmm. healing and recovery when you do decide to work out. All those things get affected. Mm -hmm. And now the insulin resistance piece is shocking because think about all these women who are in perimenopause and menopause and starting to gain this weight and can't lose it and think it's just all to do with diet. Amazing, that's amazing. Yeah, start lifting some weights there, darling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it doesn't, and I say that, like, it also doesn't have to be crazy. Um, it could be something as simple as, um, you know, I'm, I love the gym. I like going to the gym. It's my happy Weirdo. place. I, grew up, I, grew, <laughs> I know. I grew up in a, in, a, in a gym with my dad. He was a, a squash player, so it was just uh, kind of in my blood. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be much. It can be something like a leg press machine that you spend literally less than five minutes on twice a week. And that can stimulate the, the muscle tissue to stay stimulated. It can stimulate mm -hmm. that growth hormone. And it's also good for the bones and the tendons and the ligaments. Um, cardiovascularly lifting weight also is an aerobic workout. Mm. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a lot, but it's about activating that intensity a couple times a week so the system doesn't go asleep doesn't go to sleep so right. to speak right got it wow yeah yeah in fact i i think it should almost never be intense unless you know especially as a, a a woman going into perimenopause and menopause because i think it for a lot of women that triggers cortisol issues when it's extreme and you know that's a subject for another day but i totally. see it a lot when women have a difficult time recovering from it, high intensity workouts that's a sign that you're doing too much maybe that's interesting yeah, yeah. and i think that goes back to the nervous system piece is that if um we are still revving at a dysregulated nervous system state. Um, it will be tough to put intensity in because the system will think that it's going into a survival reaction, if mm, that makes sense. Yeah. 
And so I have done another video on exercise and healing trauma. So I would never say to someone, yeah, just start lifting weights at high intensity if their system still has trouble going for a walk for 60 minutes a day, for example. Mm -hmm. Right? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Let's go through this. I know we're getting close to our time here. Um, let's go through this list. Some of the things that um, you mentioned to me around healthy sleep and sleep hygiene. I would say we don't have to dive into each for like minutes at a time, but maybe just give me a, a few pieces with each one. Okay. Um, knowing that, as I mentioned at the beginning, for some people they'll do all these and they'll still have trouble sleeping. Mm. So we recognize that, but these are the things, here are the common culprits you say. So tell me a bit, a bit about caffeine. You say caffeine too late in the day or too much throughout the day. Mm. This is something comes up all the time, uh, uh, in the estrogen dominant support group because so many women, um, are, you know, they, well, let's just say it, call it like it is. They're addicted to caffeine and mm -hmm. caffeine is classified as a drug by the FDA and it, um, it is highly addictive and it raises cortisol. Now it can do amazing things. Caffeine is, has antioxidants and polyphenols and it's, it can be so good for you in many, many ways. But if you are struggling with sleeping, you know, waking up. I know it's difficult because you're saying, well, if I'm awake in the middle of the night, I can't yeah. sleep, but yet I'm exhausted all day. How am I supposed to function? Um, yeah. I just say, look, there's got to be a way that you can figure out how to maneuver, um, uh, half calves, you know, green tea one day, caf caffeinated coffee the next, or if you're doing five cups of coffee, try to do three, you know, there's, there, the goal is just to find a way to start to wean down or you don't want to quit altogether because many of you know how hard that is. Um, yeah. but to start to wean down and support adrenal function, because you can't do that, get off a of coffee or reduce caffeine intake, caffeine intake, not just coffee. But, yeah. um, and then expect that you're going to eventually get over it because your adrenals need support through that process, through that withdrawal. Uh, now if you're someone who gets up and has a bulletproof coffee and you're like amazing and then you go to bed at night and you sleep like a baby, I'm not talking to you. You know, yeah. you get great benefit from caffeine in that way. I'm talking about people who are suffering from insomnia and who have cortisol issues and who have panic attacks and anxiety attacks yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, the heart's just going crazy because of that yeah. stimulant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I think that covers that. Mm -hmm. It also sounds like put more fiber into your diet if you're trying to get off of caffeine. <laughs> just fiber. Fiber is the answer. Fiber, fiber, fiber. Okay. Too large of a meal before bed. Talk about that one. So I used to always say as healthy gut girl, don't eat before you go to bed. And then the science started to, uh, conflict with that message and also with my own experiences I would really just try to be done with with anything of eating anything at 7 30 and um and then end up waking up hungry yeah. <laughs> and so you know we it just goes I don't even have to speak much more on this except to say uh point back to what we talked about earlier your brain your body is doing a lot of work while you sleep and it needs fuel to do so I just wouldn't eat a massive meal before you go to bed. That's all. Cause the digestion yeah. process can keep you up. So, you know, eating a normal meal before, you know, an hour before bed or two hours before bed, and then a snack right before bed is totally doable. Yeah. And I yeah. suggest so, it. Yeah. Don't, don't have Thanksgiving dinner at 1130 at night, basically. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I like this next one, Wi-Fi or other high EMF, which is electromagnetic frequency mm -hmm. emitters like rotors, smart meters, digital clocks, smart devices, or TVs in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. This to me, like this is a big one for me because of my history of chemical and fluid trauma, actually, that makes me more sensitive to those sorts of fluid frequencies. Um, I actually, when I travel, hasn't mm -hmm. happened recently, but I carry mask and tape always with me so that when I'm in a hotel, I mask and tape or duct tape over the blinky things on the TVs ah, or wow. the, the detector or the thermostat that like has a thing that goes off. Yeah. 
because those things drive me mental Mm -hmm. and I unplug everything and I bring my own clocks. Mm. Well, that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there's, that's a really smart thing to do. Even if you don't get, uh, triggered by it, even if you have no reaction to it or it doesn't bother you, it's still a good thing to do because digital output, those frequencies and that, the light, those lights from your uh, smoke detectors and whatnot, Mm -hmm. those, those have frequencies to them. And in fact, you know, you have, you can put on certain types of filtered glasses and you can see how much they blink. Um, Mm. And the frequency is quite high. And so they, they beat several times per second. And so it's like literally having, you know, a light just fluttering in your eyes, even if it's at a distance, even if your eyes are closed. I always say to people, if you could put on, there's no such thing, but if you could put on a (laughs) special kind of glasses that could allow you to see light in all frequencies, right? Every kind of emitted wave or, uh, from radiation to Wi-Fi to, um, you know, your microwave, which actually is a type of Wi-Fi, believe it or not. Yeah. And, um, you know, every the digital clocks and the yes. watch on the watch you're wearing, uh, your Fitbit, all that stuff. If you could put glasses on and see that you would not want to take one step forward because <laughs> there would be waves and lines and laser beams and all over the place. Um, Now, what does that mean for us? Frankly, they're not entirely sure. They don't really know for certain what the effects are because it's never been done. We've never been, now our planet has this this, uh, Starlink, thanks to Elon Musk, who launched these, these satellites that cage in our Earth and are allowing Wi-Fi to get to places where there is none, which I don't believe that for one second, but anyway. (laughs) So it's it's basically, we can't escape these frequencies now. So I say we have to mitigate the damage. We have to mitigate, you know, otherwise you'll go bonkers trying to, trying to, this guy down the street has a big banner on his, on his house that says, shame on you, Verizon, Wi-Fi emissions hurt children. And though I appreciate his passion, you know, it's probably all for naught, but what he can do, what he can do is in his home, he can start to unplug his Wi-Fi at night. He can tell his neighbors this story, you know, let them listen to this you know, podcast, share the knowledge and not in a frantic way, but in a, look, this is factual. These are real things. And we don't really know the outcomes. We know that some people are more sensitive like you than other people. We know they can cause skin conditions and uh, Mm -hmm. focus disruption. So let's just mitigate it's not going to hurt anybody to unplug your router. Oh, totally. Right. A hundred percent. It's interesting. My husband and I were looking at a piece of property outside of the city last weekend. We were so excited because it was on this beautiful five acres. and, And then we got there and it's out in the country where there is a reservoir, hydroelectric power. And sure enough, straight through the property were those massive towers of electricity going to a substation. And of course I drove up, I'm like, yeah, there's no way. And I felt terrible for the real estate agent that came out there to meet us, you know, but as we stayed in that house, I started to feel pressure and we just felt off our head, like very sensitive beings. We are, Mm -hmm. um, my husband and I, and I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, wow, I wonder if the family that lives here has any sense of this. Mm. Um, cause most people don't No, they don't. Um, And but wouldn't you say, I don't know that it's just that you're sensitive as you're aware, maybe that's the same thing, because I think everybody is affected. I just don't know that we're making the correlation. You that's know, true. like like I always sit here and I think, God, I got this ergo chair, I feel like I'm sitting straight, but yet I get this tension while I'm tension. here. Oh, yeah. And I've got these, <laughs> all these, I'm surrounded by devices, look at me. Yep. So why, oh, yeah. you know, we don't default to that. We default yeah. to, oh, I must be sitting wrong or it must be, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, we could go down the rabbit hole with that, but we won't. Um, <laughs> we need to start a show, you and I. Just I know, so we I should. Yeah. Maybe we should. Okay, <laughs> there, we've planted the seed into the universe. Um, bright lights outside artificial lights. I feel like we've kind of covered this. 
Um, but holy moly, it amazes me how many Airbnbs I've gone to, Kitty, where they do not have proper curtains. And it drives me bonkers. Mm -hmm. And I say it again to my husband because he's usually with me. Do people not understand you need blackout curtains in your room? And and yet it seems that people can sleep without proper curtains. What are your Mm -hmm. thoughts on that? You know, I can do both. So I'm not even really sure. Now, here's the question, you know. You need melatonin to go to sleep at night. Your, your body yeah. produces melatonin. And then it actually produces melatonin when, it has, when it sunlight hits um, oh. the eyeball. Oh. And, and more melatonin. So melatonin is used for sleeping and for waking. So I, if it wasn't for all the artificial light outside, I don't think I would have any curtains at all because I would want to go to sleep with the light and awake with the light. But, um, but because of all the street lights and whatnot, you know, we have that. So maybe, you know, I can sleep with the street light, but I wonder how mm-hmm. is it affecting my waking Your ability sleep. and my sleeping yeah. ability? So yeah. I just say err on the side of caution and black out your room at night or get you some, can. um, get some, eye what's an eye mask. Mask stuff. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, no wind down time before bed. And this might go into also just having a chiller, chilled routine, unplugging a little sooner. Um, And I'll even put in here, you said develop a breath, prayer, meditation routine. And you said this is way underrated. Mm. Um, Yeah, I'm my own guinea pig on this one. Yes. Um, I'm just somebody who is all full of ideas and all full of content in my head. I sleep it, I dream it, I wake up guess what? You know, my husband must like, I'm like, I had a dream or whatever. And you know, you you might be in a fantastic mood or just a chill mood, but you might be the type of person that is active in your mind more than the average person. And because you've been that way all your life, you're not thinking anything of it. So, um, I, when I started a meditation prayer nights, it changed my life because Mm. I, you know, not just for sleeping calmly, but dreaming. My dreams were not anxious. They were not confused. They, whenever I Mm. commit to those things and support adrenal function, I'll add again, you know, your dreams or you, maybe you don't even dream, but you start to dream. And it's just like your, your brain is just having this exhaust process at night without you interfering Mm -hmm. with it, with your own, control and your own whatever you just watched you know you're watching the news even if it's an hour before bed or you're watching yeah. a, a, a michael bay movie or quentin tarantino movie yeah. you know these things go into our subconscious so we need to let our bodies exhaust right like a like that's another word for that yeah and then our brains will do that while you're sleeping as well so winding down mm-hmm. i think is so important and and that can be um, breathing can do that and prayer can do that, you know, uh, and meditation or mix those all together, which I love to do. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I often, um, if I know it's been a busy day and I haven't had enough, what you might call self-care during the day, Mm -hmm. um, I love the bath, like I could live in the bath. Um, So that is an important one at some point after the work day ends. Um, But I'll often just lay down on the floor and do some of my gentle movement that could I, I often just fall asleep on the floor and then when I'm like oh what just happened then I'll crawl into bed mm-hmm. um the one thing that's interesting is that my husband and I we don't sleep in the same room we have separate rooms we're very old school really and so we have we have the capacity because we have a home with two bedrooms um but that was something that shifted so much um I don't know how we ever slept together to be honest uh-huh. um but we're pro- we are big energy so we're always processing stuff uh-huh. um we might have a nap together and fall asleep in the middle of the day and snuggle that but at night it's like see ya oh wow that's <laughs> yeah. so interesting i can see that working really well for yeah. me <laughs> Yeah, well, and it's funny because there's often this taboo that if you're sleeping in separate bedrooms that you have a troubled relationship and far mm-hmm. from it, it actually gives us our own space. And so, you for know, those that, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, they, they did this uh, study. I don't remember who or when or how I saw it, but it was a video. They, they videoed couples with a pet um, and they just watched them in the middle of the night sleeping. 
and okay. uh, how much the dog wakes them up. And then they also showed um, uh, just without a pet and how much one wakes up the other and how it can disrupt your sleep and you don't even realize it, you know? And that was fascinating because we sleep with our dog and, you know, you think that they just go to bed in one way and, you know, wake up in another way and that's not it at all. They're moving throughout the night, they're shaking, they're they're scratching. Yeah. And then you yourself, you know, like you might snore, you might make, whatever, you turn over and now you may not have woken your partner up completely, but they wake up enough to move around and that's huh? shown in this video. So that makes a lot of sense. That's Sleeping interesting. On. Yeah. I know they have some beds that they've created. We don't have one because we obviously don't sleep together, but where one side, if you move, it doesn't impact the other. Mm -hmm. I don't know what those beds are, but I mean, they've tried yeah. to figure it all out. Like sleep seems. number beds or something. I think I know what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think one, I'm going to go to two more. Um, put your phone in airplane mode. Now this is an interesting one because I don't bring my phone into the loft that I sleep in. Mm -hmm. um, I leave even it better. downstairs, turned off. I won't even charge it at night. Um, I think this is just kind of a given, don't you think? But I think a lot of people do use their planes or their planes, their phones near them mm -hmm. for an alarm clock mm -hmm. in case there's an emergency. Like gone are the days of a landline, it seems, even though we do have one here. Uh huh. You know, if there's an emergency. Yeah. A person can, it's sort of an odd thing these days, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I put mine on airplane mode, so does my husband, but it is in the room. And mm. you're right, the better thing to do is to not have it in the room at all. In fact, could you have a room with nothing plugged in, you know, would yeah. be really great. Um, yeah. But the reality is that, again, okay, I had a podcast called the, the Killer Bees in the Room, and it's just basically mitigate it. Like, if they're in the room already, what can yeah. you do? You know, let's yeah. go from there. And so what can we do to mitigate that? Can you, you have to have your alarm in your room? Okay, well, let's do that. And then let's um, put it on airplane mode because then the Wi-Fi connection isn't happening. So you don't have that current, that frequency traveling from your yeah. router into your phone, crossing through, you know, your, you. <laughs> yeah. Right? I remember having a Blackberry, remember those ages ago, that actually could be off and the alarm would still go off in the morning. Yeah, that is actually these phones now too. I think iPhones do that now too. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. And um, I, said, I said something wrong. I don't bring my phone in the bedroom, sorry. I, no, that's fine. I have, I do sometimes, but yeah. um, I leave mine out here charging and then my, my husband takes his and we wake up to his alarm. Okay. Um, but for a while I was, it was right by my head and I knew yeah. better. And then I was like, you know, no, it's not good. Yeah. More killer bees. Yeah, the other thing and um, that I forgot is a lot of people are into their Fitbit watches and these things. And I've always been very skeptical of those, to be honest. They drove me crazy when they were new because I'd be out for coffee or dinner with a girlfriend and they'd have this thing on their wrist. And every time there'd be a notification, they would look at it and it, it was just maddening. Yeah. Um, but my assistant was wearing one and for whatever reason, she realized about a year after, and I'm really paraphrasing the story that she had started to get shoulder pain after starting to wear this, this Apple watch thing. And mm -hmm. so she finally experimented by taking it off and all the shoulder pain went away. Wow. Uh, that is not unusual, really. I don't think at all, mm -hmm. you know, um, laptops on people's laps, literally, and the bone pain that they feel in their quads. Oh. Um, I mean, I've heard, yeah, it's not shocking to me at all. And the more we use these devices, the more, um, and how many we have in one room where it used to be, you didn't have the iPhone. You just had your laptop or your computer. computer. Yeah. And now it's everything, smart TV, smart, everything, smart washer and dryer, smart meters, <laughs> everything. My, I have a, a yeah. Roomba that, that is connect. I don't connect it, but it, it can connect to Wi-Fi. It can. And all those frequencies just think of spider web. Off. It's just another yeah. strand across your purview, yeah. across your home, across your body. Interesting. Yeah. All right, last one on the list, a sleep aid. You said a healthy sleep aid like CBD or 
plant-based melatonin or high quality magnesium. Mm. Um, you know, one, just quickly, I remembered uh, there was a study done on the microbiome no. in EMFs and how oh, much wow. it also can sedate or affect the microbiome. So there's that. Um, Crazy. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So yeah, um, CBD has really come on the scene pretty hard and uh, I don't really mm -hmm. recommend with THC because so many people do such different things with it. So I recommend guidance with that. But um, CBD from hemp is incredible. It's got mm. very, very, very little, if any, um, THC in it. And um, it, it, uh, our whole, our bodies have an endocannabinoid system. So yep. cannabinoids are, you know, CBD, uh, ca cannabis, or I'm uh, sorry, cannabidiols. Our body receives that as medicine and it can totally help regulate your endocrine system. S uh, sleep aid, incredible sleep aid. If you take, I always say start with low and slow because mm -hmm. CBD is funny. If you take too much, it can actually do the opposite. I Magnesium, can imagine that. Magnesium, I can't say enough about how amazing and important magnesium is. I stay away from magnesium citrate, story for uh, another day. I try okay. to, because the calm magnesium is the one people go to, to for sleeping yep. and for bowel movements. Citrate, um, take it if you love it, that's fine, but I avoid it. It's not the greatest for mineral balance in the body. The better, a more absorb, it's, there's a reason it comes right out of you. But the more mm -hmm. absorbable forms of magnesium, like glycinate and threonate and all these other forms that are really good, um, can help you sleep, can help support adrenal function. Really important. Uh, yeah, so magnesium is everything. Hormone good to balance. Know. Yeah. Good to know. That's interesting about the citrate because I have tried that calm and I've noticed that with my bowels. It is in the morning very loose and not mm -hmm. typical. Mm hmm. So that's good to know because that's become kind of a hot thing, the powder thing, and it's all yeah. fizzy and Well, there good. are others that aren't citrate. So I, ha okay. I have a bunch I recommend that we can link to later or something. But yeah, Beautiful. I'd avoid citrate. And then the last one was melatonin. I've heard differing opinions around mel melatonin mm -hmm. and taking it. What's your, what, what's your go-to with this? Mm, melatonin got a really bad rap because most melatonins on the market were bovine melatonin. So they were made from mm -hmm. cow melatonin and they are not cell resonant with our own production of melatonin. They do not, they, our body doesn't use it in the same way. So um, it can just wreak havoc in the body in many ways. Plant-based melatonin, first of all, melatonin is an master antioxidant and a master hormone in the body and so yeah. it's also an anti-aging hormone uh it's it's so incredible for so many things and um including gut health and lung health and it's it's creates like a lot oh, like wow. progesterone it has a lot of important functions in the body but uh it does, if you take melatonin, it does downregulate your own production of melatonin. That's not a permanent thing, but it does yeah. downregulate. All, any kind of hormone that you take does downregulate like, your own production. It's like taking creatine, does the same thing. It really does it. You, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a permanent thing, but mm -hmm. I always say, if you're not making melatonin, then you kind of want to take it then, right? Like if, you know, if it down regulates progesterone production, but you're not making progesterone, that sounds like a good thing to me. So mm -hmm. really is it, it's up to you and how you, you know, feel about that, but it's a very important. Uh, it's so good for you. And so I recommend it. Also, if you don't need it, so if you take melatonin and it doesn't help you, you probably don't you probably don't need it. You're probably Doesn't making need... melatonin and mel yeah. melatonin deficiency is probably not the reason for your insomnia. Right. This wasn't on your list, but how important is sunshine and sunlight during the day? Hmm. Gosh, sunshine, sunlight pushes the DHA into the eye to then produce and with 5-HTP make melatonin. That's how important it is. Get out. It produces DHA? It, no, it, it pushes DHA. Pushes. I know. It, for, it, it's the mechanism by which DHA, the healthy fat, gets driven into the eye to then produce uh, this downstream effect of making melatonin. Through, through hydroxy tryptophan. 5-HTP, sunshine, DHA, 
and that process happens. I know. I, I need to kind of um, understand so the biochemistry of it, but it's uh, it's it, that's so important. It's so important. Wow. I mean, vitamin D. You know, it, it's like it's in everything. It's an antioxidant. It's an antiviral. It's an antibacterial. Sunshine is just God. You know, so it's just important. pure oh, yeah. God. There's a reason it's there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now that's really interesting. Okay, well, so you get sunglasses. More from... So be careful with wearing sunglasses too much. I say. I would. I would assume con I wear contact lenses, so that I know that there's a filter. So that's probably mm. another thing. If we're wearing contacts, it's not the sun's not coming through the eye. I've never thought um, about that. Mm hmm. 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 Okay. Well, when you get more info on that, let me know. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, I can't speak on it yet, but now I'm curious. <laughs> All right, we've covered a lot. We've mm -hmm. been going for almost two hours. Holy moly. Um, quickly, you are, you're not doing private consults anymore, are you? Well, I am, but I've really reduced my uh, ability. Uh, you know, I've, I've narrowed down how many people I can take in a month. So I am, and that is on okay. my website um, okay. to book a consult. And we'll have it linked, but just name your website so that it's for the record on, yeah. on audio. It's healthygutgirl.com. Mm -hmm. And my podcast is Stuff Your Doctor Should Know. Perfect. And you mm -hmm. have got, as you mentioned, the Estrogen Dominance Facebook group, which is pretty active in Hopin. Yeah, Estrogen um, Dominance Support Group is what it's called. And it's a private group, so you have to join. Um, it's fantastic. It's really, it really has just transformed my life. In, no, in personal ways, in my career as well. It's been incredible and it's so useful for so many women. Great. Just the, the guidance there and all the different people, practitioners, experiences. Yeah, I love that group. <laughs> cool. And you also have some products that I know that you've recently, do you wanna just speak to that really briefly about what they are? I just took a, I took a job as CEO in my all my spare time that I don't have. <laughs> Um, uh, of Ona's, which is Ona's Natural. It's a plant-based hormone support company. They make creams that are, um, creams and oils that are to support uh, progesterone levels, estrogen levels, testosterone levels. And I just came out with a new product called Calm Cream, which is actually CBD from hemp and progesterone. So that Beautiful. is an adrenal, you know, cortisol support and also hormone support. And yeah, um, that's, that's that. And that's, that's all, it. yeah. Do you guys ship internationally? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Good Not to know. everywhere, but yes. Okay. And one thought that came in, if so it feels as though most of your clientele are women. Mm -hmm. If a male should be listening to this and would like some help with gut health, hormone health, health what, do you work with Absolutely. The, the, the boys? Yes. I awesome. do. And yeah, I do. Good. That's mm -hmm. good to know. All right. Anything you want to add? Any mm. final notes of anything yeah, for there those was listening? Something. I wrote it down. You you yeah. said, um, uh, you know, I can't remember what you triggered. What triggered you to me to think this? But I'll, I always go back because because things can be so. Oh, it was the anxiety thing. Like you can't mm. do a thirty minute video on anxiety because everyone's so different. And I can't say, okay, yes, you should do progesterone or yes, you should do pro probiotics. Yeah. But what I can say is you can never go wrong paying attention to those basic foundational things regarding digestion. What are you eating? Are you digesting it? Are you process? Are you absorbing it? And are you excreting it? If you focused on those things and then your work together, you don't even have to worry about melatonin and you don't have I to agree. worry about all that stuff. Like just start there. That's beautiful. I, yeah. That's a great place to end. Thank you so much. Ah, uh, thank you. You're so lovely. And I'm just excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Let's start that podcast. Let's do it. <laughs>